Welcome and thank you for attending this Lunch and Learn session organised in collaboration between the Knowledge and Library Services at NCIC and CLIC, the Cumbria Learning and Improvement Collaborative. My name is Ashley Eaton and I am from CLIC and today we are joined by Dr. Prasanna De Silva, who is a consultant for old age from the CNTW Foundation Trust and he's going to present a care home liaison during COVID-19 experience from Wareside. Okay. Hello everyone. So just to briefly explain who I am, I was seconded from Sunderland to uh, North Cumbria to help with the uh, consultant shortage for a start, but also to assist with care, care home liaison, the chess team, which was uh, or has been lacking uh, consultant uh, supervision for some time now. Um, I was glad to do so because I have been asking Sunderland uh, whether I can look after all the care homes in Sunderland, which was 52, uh, but that never happened. So I was quite happy with the secondment and I now look after 72 care homes in North Cumbria, both east and west and south, which is Penrith. So it's all kind of focused around Carlisle, Penrith and uh, the west, which is kind of a number of uh, towns there. Uh, the chess team is largely divided into three bits and I liaise with all three. Um, you know something about geography of Wearside, I hope it's basically the river Weir is south of the river Tyne and north of the river Tees and Wearside has always been industrial. That's why they are called Macams. Macams means make them uh, and uh, also, Wearside has had a long history of uh, mining villages, uh, which uh, obviously came to an end during Thatcher years, and they're still an active, very kind of connected up communities in uh, Wearside, the areas we call the coal fields. So I hope that's enough of a background. The other thing is I'm, um, I've been an uh, employee of the NHS, very happily, to be honest, uh, for 37 years now. I'm hoping to make 40 uh, and I've been given a challenge by our trust chair to make it 50 because he said I've done 50. You can do that as well. So I'm um, I'm here for the the, <laughs> the duration, really, um, which may or may not be a good thing. How do I move slides here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, in Wearside, uh, we did have a bit of a pre-COVID plan in hand, which had been actioned, uh, which was lucky because we didn't see COVID coming. So this involved an organization called ATB or All Together Better, and that was set up in 2018. Uh, that's to advise the, uh, the Wearside CCG on uh, mental health matters. Uh, and also to advise uh, the Sunderland Vanguard. Sunderland was appointed a Vanguard on Frasdy and uh, ATB was there to advise Sunderland Vanguard as well. ATB uh, comprised of the uh, GP practices, GP Alliance, uh, Mental Health, our trust and local authority. And it was, it was assisted by Age UK and our Sunderland Carer Centre. Uh, all very established uh, organizations uh, and really ATB has been a success in that people have uh, got together, sat together and uh, was actually actioning things before COVID happened. So what was done before COVID? Um, they arranged for each um, care home to be supervised by a single GP practice. That was in any case advice from uh, NHS England, NHS Improvement, sorry. Um, but that was done. Uh, they set up five step down hubs, uh, which were kind of rehab units uh, to step down from acute care. Uh, and that was co-terminus with the five CPNs we have. Uh, and also along with that, they appointed uh, frailty focused advanced nurse practitioners and also appointed a clinical pharmacist per each PCN. Uh, to tackle the medication needs of care homes, but also this overall issue about polypharmacy, particularly psychiatric polypharmacy. Some of the care homes of the 52, I can't remember exactly how many, but something like 20 care homes were the staff were trained in news too. And that I guess is the big news for the Vanguard 
because uh, they found that uh, the, the care homes which trained staff in news two showed a reduced uh, pattern of emergency admissions, something in the order of 40%. And this was largely uh, preventing people who had fallen, but, but also people with uh, early uh, delirium suggestive of constipation and urine retention and stuff like that. Staff were able to pick it up and discuss with the GPs with rapid action without having to uh, be taken to uh, A&E. So I think that that was the big news of the Vanguard. I, I hope that's going to get published at some stage because uh, that's actually, to my mind, quite big news that a training program can actually reduce acute unplanned admissions. So then we had COVID lockdowns, one and two. We had just hopefully managed to avoid a third. So as you know, uh, the bad news was in retrospect, we think uh, 30,000 people died in care homes in England and about 10,000 people in Scotland. Um, what happened during COVID was face-to-face -face access to community staff was significantly restricted by the various care homes and their, their kind of employers. Uh, there were mandated transfers from acute hospitals to care home beds uh, because they wanted to clear acute hospital beds. And there were increasing infections in care homes of COVID, uh, some care homes earlier than others. Personally, uh, I was looking after something like 15 care homes in my patch in the coal fields, and I lost I lost two patients who I was dealing with. And uh, I think my colleagues are telling me that actually I was quite lucky to have such a low number, but uh, I did see them die and it wasn't very pleasant. Tell, I can I can tell you what we found was there was limited access to ambu ambulatory oxygen. Uh, initially, not enough uh, PPE uh, for some care homes for staff and limited testing facilities for care home staff as well. So th that was the situation at the start of the lockdown. So how did we respond? The community services as a whole uh, the uh, GPs led on this rapid application of emergency health care plans and DNARs, and we had a, uh, I think they had a target of 95% set up by NHS England uh, uh, regards care homes, and that was achieved largely, it was about 94%. Um, care home managers and or advanced nurse practitioners were seeking consent among the people at care homes who were capacitors, and GPs were phoning family regards the incapacitors seeking consent. From our trust point of view, from CNTW, uh, we allocated a CPN for each of the care homes and they contacted the care homes weekly to provide support for the staff particularly, but also pick up on any issues which were ongoing due to the lockdown. Uh, so there was fast tracking of challenging behavior issues or psychosis uh, requiring treatment. And obviously as consultants, we got involved in that. Um, there is this thing for challenging behavior called the Newcastle model, which is a kind of formulation which uh, takes a significant amount of time, like two weeks observations and attendance, but that was abbreviated to, uh, to a rapid formulation. And there were uh, arrangements to, uh, for e-scripts. In other words, we could actually send an electronic script to the pharmacy to be dispensed uh, to speed up uh, uh, you know, uh, access to medication for care homes. So that's what we did. So this moving on to what needs to be done before future lockdowns, I'm quite sure there will be. Um, so I think in the kind of quiet period we are going to go through over the next few months, we need to review uh, emergency health care plans and DNARs, but this time with a bit more time and a bit bit more uh, time taken for informed consent. My personal view about uh, these two measures, particularly the emergency health care plans, was in retrospect, we know that acute hospitals were, were a major site, major focus of viral infections, of aerosolized viruses. So actually, we were doing our best for the patients for uh, to make sure that people were 
less likely to be admitted to acute care because they're very likely that they, they would pick up uh, COVID-19 soon after coming into hospital. So in retrospect, I think that was the right thing to do. That's a change of opinion from when I when I was first thinking about this. But in retrospect, that was the kindest thing to do. Um, we need to be more careful about uh, transfers from to care homes. So maybe we need to have uh, flows which are open for uh, people who are potentially infectious rather than contaminating the ones who are already there. And also we need to encourage but not mandate uh, staff vaccinations. We can't afford to lose lots of staff for personal opinions. Um, contentious topic, uh, but that's my opinion. Um, what I'm doing is uh, organizing the use of uh, virtual uh, consultations, MST, Zoom, arguably WhatsApp, to review care home patients. Um, I need to, I think most of the doctors who are doing this are adapting our consultation technique uh, for uh, consultations um, assisted by either care home staff or visiting CPNs. And one kind of practical thing I've learned over the last uh, four months is I need to be closer to the screen so that the patient can see my face in more detail. Uh, whereas if I sat back and they didn't really see my facial expressions and things, they're less liable to uh, communicate with me. Uh, in terms of telephone consultations, my tempo of consultation has gone down, so it's slower and more kind of cautious, uh, and that seems to have worked all right. So th there are kind of technical, but also personal things I have learned uh, over the last uh, few months um, in terms of uh, assisted consultations with uh, in care homes. And the um, other thing we need to do is we need to be stricter on managing polypharmacy uh, and organizing oxygen supplies because the more medication someone is on in a care home, more complicated it is to deliver that medication into the care home and obviously more drug to drug interactions. Uh, you know, doctors are terrible at adding medication to a current list rather than taking one off. And my training in Aberdeen, uh, where I did most of my training was uh, if you're going to put one drug in, you have to take one or two drugs out. And that uh, can pose difficulties, to be honest. What other things could be of use? So I would like to talk to you about, uh, some, I think most of you would know about Namaste Care. And uh, obviously Namaste was uh, largely uh, designed in the States and also in third world countries to cater for people in care homes. Namaste means respect and positive interaction. Uh, and it is a care home wide intervention for both residents and staff. It involves things like music, skin and hair care, uh, lighting and smells in, 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 in a kind of Namaste room. But obviously we are looking at multi, multi channel uh, kind of uh, systems. For example, you, you've probably seen um, when you can't sleep, you look at YouTube and look at clips which say, uh, you know, clips to make you go to sleep. And that involves things like, for example, wave, mu uh, wave sounds, uh, full moons uh, and added music. So it's a multi uh, multi system kind of thing. I think that that might be actually quite useful in care homes. Um, so that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully trying to pilot in a number of care homes. I'm part of a research uh, collaborative looking at Namaste Care in terms of evidence base. Um, and as you know, Namaste Care hasn't shown uh, a strong evidence base in terms of hard metrics, in terms of less medication being used, uh, less faults, less admissions. However, there is evidence for reducing general noisiness in care home settings. Um, and I think the research people are thinking more in lines of Namaste Care being helpful for carers, formal carers in care homes in terms of improving compassion. Because one of the things uh, we know from uh, uh, research is that uh, there is kind of moral injury and there is kind of compassion drainage in among staff in care homes and we need to keep that going in order to help retention. 
So that's where research on Namastikea is going. Now then, with the ICS starting in June, can they help? Um, it took me some time to realize that the ICS in terms of integrated care was to do with integrated care of providers. It's not to do with clinical integration of care, for example, in uh, kind of horizontal integration between care of elderly, old age psychiatry, GPs, uh, physiotherapists, pharmacists, whatever, or uh, vertical integration, which in terms of um, again, GPs, consultants working together and so on and so forth. It's not to do with that. It's to do with uh, integrating pro providers, making sure different providers, trusted providers work together. Um, I think ICA should um, try and arrange for one GP practice per care home floor uh, and also work on polypharmacy mitigation via pharmacists liaising with uh, uh, teams like us, teams like CHESS. Um, there is an increasing awareness of this thing called sarcopenia, which started with the Sunderland uh, frailty uh, vanguard. But uh, now we know, or there's increasing awareness, that the people who died of COVID-19 having gone into hospital had a condition called sarcopenic obesity, which is not simply a combination of sarcopenia or lo loss of muscle and muscle strength, but it's, it's actually fatty infiltration of muscle, and that causes a massive inflammatory reaction and also uh, in, appears to increase the risk of um, death in ICUs. Uh, big news, uh, I, I'm happy to provide literature on that, but it's early days in terms of research. And uh, the treatment or mitigation of sarcopenia as far as we know now, is physio input in terms of exercise and uh, improved protein nutrition. And uh, what the government did the last lockdown, which is uh, prescribing D3 regularly for most residents at a moderately low dose of 2000 in, uh, international units per day. I think uh, this is something I, I, we had a big meeting with the uh, our trust chief exec, Kevin, clin clinical, what's he called? The, Chief Operating Officer this morning, and this is something we brought up, which is spot purchasing step down beds in care homes uh, to in order to remedy the uh, inpatient bed blocking situation. And we also need to um, get social services involvement at an early stage for discharge planning. So hopefully ICS can help with that. Um, training and support of care home staff in order to help recruitment and retention. And training include things like Namaste Care, News 2. Kate is a communication uh, training strategy for how to communicate with people with dementia, particularly those with agitation. Management of agitation, particularly non-medical, not me non-medication solutions for managing agitation. And I think there should be 24 seven MDT backup uh, from, for example, in our trust, we could potentially integrate uh, the crisis response team and CHESS as a 24-7 service in order to support uh, CHOC. And uh, in the longer term, strategy for building up EMI nursing beds and day services probably needs new builds. Uh, what we are short in, in uh, Cumbria is EMI nursing beds as opposed to residential care beds or EMI residential beds. We need probably need a new build. Uh, we need organizational mergers and third sector input, particularly carers uh, input, carers and input. So two more minutes, Dr. Silva. Oh, you're nearly there. Perfect. <laughs> so these are the references I put in for people to look at. But if people are particularly interested in this thing called sarcopenic obesity, which is going to kill many, many more people. In, in the medium term, um, I'm happy to oblige because I've done the research on that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. De Silva. Um, that was incredibly interesting and, and fantastic to hear about that kind of more holistic um, support in care homes, definitely. Um, has anybody got any questions at all for Dr. De Silva? I mean, please feel free to um, either pop them in the chat um, or um, Come, come off mute and turn on your video and share any questions that you may have. Could I ask a question then? Yes, yes please. please. Um, yes, Sheila Marsh is from the Library Service. Um, you mentioned about um, there's a need for in, in, 
um, improving the uh, patient flow between care homes and hospitals. I just wondered what what sort of measures you think might improve that. It's the other way around from hospitals to care homes. Uh-huh. That's where the blockage is at the moment. Uh-huh. And uh, have you heard of lean working? Yep. Yeah, so we have lots of books in means... the library on that, on lean. <laughs> All right, OK. Lean working uh, essentially means uh, uh, making quite sure that uh, there's no delay in time in terms of the flow of patients from hospital to community. OK. And what that entails is a daily kind of uh, what we call a huddle where people get together and ask the question, why is this person in this bed today? You know, that kind of question. And uh, the, I did uh, acute admission. Uh, sorry, acute inpatients for two years in Scarborough, and I looked after 23 uh, beds in a mixed sex, mixed uh, diagnosis unit which were geographically kind of split into male and female. And what we realized was if a patient had a previous CPN or a care coordinator, their formulation and their plan was accepted uh, for the ward. That made a huge difference because very quickly the CPN and the the ward nurse got together and rejigged the formulation so that we could tell social services this person is ready for discharge. Consequently, our duration of stay reduced to 30 uh, 30 days, which is in mental health is pretty good going. All right. Uh, It did cause problems for the inpatient nurses because there was a culture change. Uh, They they struggled to uh, accept that the community nurses formulation was already robust uh, because they were previously expected to do a full assessment going right from basics upwards, and that took months really. So uh, accepting the community uh, workers formulation as being the the basis of the uh, inpatient formulation was a big difference. Also, I think social services told us that they would prefer to know of an admission as soon as possible so that they can plan for which care home uh, we, we 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 could identify, and uh, one of the things I, I did an audit in rehab in East Yorkshire, and uh, and also Scarborough, and what we found was inpatient nurses were unaware of places opening up in care homes, both for uh, people with psychosis, but also people with dementia. So we tried to rectify that by having. Um, uh, trusted care homes we we could work with closely so that we could trans- step down people. So step down is the kind of big news what we need to do. I'm aware that there are uh, buildings which have been closed as care homes, so potentially the trust do have the option of uh, uh, spot purchasing or full purchasing uh, care home beds for step down, and hopefully that, that will break up the logjam. Sorry, a long answer to a simple question. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. De Silva. I think Jacqueline, uh, here we go. Yeah, so Jacqueline Thompson, she's, but hello, Dr. De Silva. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, we are glad to have you in NCIC. May I clarify, does the GP maintain overall clinical responsibility for the physical general health assessment of the care home residents? Uh, also, you mentioned that clinicians were prohibited from entering the care home environment in wave one. Is this still the case in North Cumbria? So answering the second question, I'm afraid it is. Um, the, the, there have been a few, uh, what's it called, the new version? Uh, the the new Omicron, isn't it? Omicron. Um, that, um, that has been uh, blamed for restrictions of care homes to care home staff. Uh, I think they are wrong. I think we should have, uh, as clinicians, we should have completely open access to care homes uh, because we are tested before we go in and there should be nothing, but nothing stopping us going into care homes. Uh, And they can't, uh, the care homes shouldn't be asking me for medication recommendations without actually uh, one of our CPNs actually being present because uh, they they can't do assisted uh, MST often. Uh, and also, you know, it, it's a two-way game, isn't it? You, you have to work together rather than restricting. I have a feeling that the restrictions are partly due to lack of care home staff. 
and uh, that that has that has wide bearing on 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 uh, care home management. First question: um, Does the GP maintain overall clinical response? Absolutely, and I found GPs extremely helpful in this patch, really helpful. I've had a chance to chat to quite a lot of them in my first uh, four months of firefighting, and uh, they have been extremely helpful. They they uh, help me with prescribing uh, a lot of the time and uh, well most of the time really um, and uh, that that's a big refreshing change uh, from my previous uh, work in Wearside because GPs expected us to do the first crib but when I'm working remotely from Sunderland I'm still living and working in Sunderland uh, it is a lot easier the GP can prescribe from day one you know so that has been a very very positive experience uh i fully appreciate gps are very hard working at the moment and are struggling particularly on the west side but i i would like to compliment them for their their efforts i think they should be really uh you know kind of uh, recognized mm -hmm. you know yeah, um, fantastic news brilliant well, thank you so much, Dr. Silva, um, and thank you, everybody, um, for attending. Um, yes, again, a direct message for the, the listeners. Please don't die of sarcopenic obesity. We now know how big a deal this is. It is connected with uh, what we call fatty liver or non-alcoholic fatty liver syndrome. Uh, it's so easy when you're working really hard to take too much sugar, to sit in front of uh, television and get frightened from what you hear. And uh, it's time we stopped all that, you know. So thank you. Thank you so much, everybody.